My stage and nickname is Killer Ray Appleton, and I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, where some of the greatest musicians in the world come from. Mr. Freddie Hubbard was the one who started me playing when I was about 10. And then there's Wes Montgomery. I started playing with him when I was 15. And uh, I met J.J. about seven years before he died. The Sound of Indianapolis, it was a place that was uh, like a, a hub, like it was a melting pot. And one of the reasons why so many uh, musicians came there was because of Wes. Because Wes, you, you wouldn't believe that if you'd seen him. He took the guitar to the place where there's no one that will ever be able to get past what West Montgomery done on the guitar. No one. There's no way that you can ever manage to do what he did to the guitar. And the octaves and, the, 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 and everything that he played, uh, the only way that he came up with that was because that was the only way he could tune up, was with two notes at a time. So he came out with the octave. And there's not a guitar player in the world that doesn't run across that. And the thing that was really uh, so uh, amazing about Wes Montgomery, he didn't start playing until he was 23 years old. And he started on bass. His brother gave him an electric bass. And that's how he got started. He already had four or five kids by the time he started playing. My goodness. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was quite hard for him because he uh, had those kids and then he worked at a Polk's Milk Company. He cleaned the office. He played at a place called George's Bar from 9 to 2. And then he played at an after hour place called the Missile Room from 2 to 5. He'd get a couple hours of sleep and get up and do the same thing all over. Well, I played drums, and uh, what happened was, uh, it, th this is how it started for me. It was a guy that lived down the street from me. His name was Harold Pee Wee Williams, and he was my good friend. And so it was a Sunday afternoon, and it was real hot, and uh, I was out playing marbles by myself because everybody used to tease me because I was so fat, you know. And uh, so he said, well, come on with me. We're going down to the to the firehouse where they got the drum and bugle for I said, I don't want to be going to no drum and bugle for He said, come on, because he was older than I was. So, you know, I, I went, and it was seven drums down there, and one of the drummers didn't show up. And so Pee Wee said, well, get on the mess, stop beating on the drum, that's all we doing. And I got over there and started playing on the drums, and it, it all started from there. Wow. The, the, the guy that was in charge, that was the teacher of this, uh, said, son, you got some talent, what school you go to? I said, I go to school 56. He said, well, that's uh, Larry Liggett's uh, territory. Would you like to be in the band? I said, I guess so. He said, you got talent. Well, and when I started that in, in, in 48, I was, guess I was seven, eight years old. And then when I was 10, I met Freddie Hope. And I never, ever looked back to anything uh, other than being engrossed in this music right to the day. Uh, Freddie was a great, great influence, and he showed me how to do things. And the first jazz record that I heard uh, Freddie took me to, to listen to it, and it was called Studying Brown by Clifford Brown and Max Roach, and I just couldn't believe it. My life never was the same. Never was the same. My mother said, what is all of this? What is this? <laughs> she, she said, my goodness, what is all this noise y'all doing? What is this? And she just couldn't understand it, you know, because I became like a, in a daze like, that's how, uh, how beautiful it was to me. Well, what inspired me was uh, all of the great musicians that was in Indianapolis at that time. Uh, you know, uh, Pookie Johnson and James Pauling and Larry, Dr. Larry Ridley. And, and I started playing with Dave Baker when I was very young, Dr. Dave Baker. And uh, it was other guys that were there that were great um, you know, players, Harold Malone and Bill Roy. And uh, just a lot of great, good musicians. Matter of fact, Jack McDuff, he came there and stayed there for a while. And he got his springboard from Indianapolis.
members. And uh, like I said, a lot of them used to come there from surrounding cities like Columbus, Ohio, Louisville, Kentucky, St. Louis, Chicago. They would come there looking for Wes, you know, because, uh, you know, Wes was just unbelievable, you know. And uh, that inspired me about seeing him and, and listening to him. And then I started playing with him and he started teaching me this and teaching me that, you know. And uh, I became the musician that I am today. What actually got me started and fascinated by it was when uh, Ray Charles used to come through Indianapolis and he had a drummer named Wilbur Hogan that was playing drums. And Wilbur, used, I was 11, he used to get me and he brought me right up on the bandstand and, and set me right beside him when he was kicking that band. And he was showing me, like, reading it, you know. And, and, and I was, so I said, oh, goodness. When they left, when they left and got in the bus and left, I cried like a baby. I said, I want to go with them. And uh, I really, really became fascinated with the music. And then when Freddie, when I met Freddie, then uh, that was the other answer that I needed. Musicians that are coming up, that's in the next generation or whatever, uh, the, the first thing that they have to do is stay away from drugs and alcohol. Because when I was coming up, that was a big part of all of it, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, all of that, you know, the, the bars and the hanging out and the, and the smoking and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff like that. Those kids these days don't have to go through that. I hope that they don't go through it, you know. But it's something that do, but not on the general whole. The young musicians that I see these days, they got more sense than that. Well, for one thing, all that's played out anyway. You know, if you, you're doing that and, and drugs and everything, you're going to get arrested and put in jail because they're not tolerating that anymore. You know, the, um, the thing about playing drums is that you have to remember to keep your power together. If you don't have power and you're playing drums, it doesn't sound right. It, it doesn't fit this music. The stronger you are and the, the longer you play, the stronger you're supposed to get. Elvin Jones told me that before he died. He said, you know, you must play more intense with you, the longer you play, not get weak. The other way around, and uh, I, I learned that from him. He taught me a lot. Well, well matter of fact, all of them did. Philly Joe, the big four: Philly Joe, Max Roach, Art Blakey, and Elvin Jones. Right? Those four drummers showed me a lot, you know, because mm -hmm. they were called the big four. You know, and uh, I just stayed up under those guys. You know, I just just loved those guys so much. You know. And Philly Joe, uh, I lived with him for about a year. You know, he was incredible. The first time I seen Philly Joe, he broke four sticks in one tune. It was, it, the sticks were just like kindling or something. That's how powerful and strong he was, you know. And uh, I was really impressed with that. Well, I was in Europe, and uh, we were... I forget who I was playing with. I was playing with, playing with a Dutch piano player named Kate Slinger. And uh, we played in Amsterdam and we were going to Paris with this little, little five city tour. And the driver that was driving, when we got through with the gig, well, we were hanging out at the bar, uh, you know, relaxing. And he was there at the bar too. I said, you're supposed to be sleeping. And he said, I'm all right. So we were driving. Uh, the Paris, he dozed off, and the car went down a gully and hit a tree, oh. and my legs got pinned. Oh. Oh. It didn't happen to him, of course. Of course. My goodness. And when did that happen? I guess that was in 1993. Wow. I came back here in 94. Wow. And they tried to save my leg, but they couldn't. My goodness. I felt pretty bad at first, but hey, it wasn't going to grow back. So, you know, you, I can not begrudge that. Yeah. I was in therapy for quite a while to be able to uh, play, you know, again. And I couldn't play for maybe two years, three yeah. years. But 
but everything's fine now. I don't have any complaints. It's an honor to be able to give back a little bit of what you've given to the world with your music yeah. and the sacrifices that you've made. Jazz Foundation of America is an organization that helps the musicians that are having uh, fall on bad times here or there. Uh, they do memorials for the musicians that have passed on. You know, they give great send-offs and, uh, and, and, and memorials for them. And uh, it's, it, it would be very well recommended if you could give a donation uh, to this foundation that helps people and uh, uh, that have been involved in this music for so many years. I want to ask you a question. How old is this? The 22 years. It's 22 years. Well, it's a great situation. I, I know I, I got involved with it. Wendy, uh, she's great. And uh, the people that own the Jazz Standard, which is one of my great friends, James Polsky, well, he had told me, he said, you should get involved in the Jazz Foundation, especially with the seniority that you have in playing this music and the people that you play with, which I play with everybody in this business, just about. Well, the album, it's a, it's a sextet. No, it's a septet, matter of fact. Uh, it's with some great guys, or guys that, that I chose to play with me that are really good musicians. Mr. Brian Lynch, uh, Todd Herbert, uh, Ian Smith, Rick Germanson, Bob Saban, and Lil John Rivera. This man, Compass, couple tunes. It's a nice album. You're gonna like it when it comes out. It's gonna be on iTunes and all that.